2020 National Seminar in Interp. Um, I want to start um, this evening by giving um, our wonderful staff an opportunity to introduce themselves so you know exactly who is working uh, and commenting and helping put this seminar together. My name is Meg Howell. I am the coach at Mountain View High School in Mesa, Arizona, and I'm the curriculum director for the Interp section of ISD. Uh, Ian? Hi, everybody. I'm Ian Lampert, coach at Valley International Prep in Chatsworth, California, and I'm one of the senior instructors here in interpretation at ISD. Lillian? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lillian Adiemi. I am the assistant director at Seven Lakes High School in Houston, well, really Katy, Texas, and I'm one of the senior instructors here at ISD. Jared? Hi, I'm Jared Shapiro. I graduated last year from Hawkins School in uh, Ohio, and I'm currently a rising second year at Ohio State. How was your first year, Jared? It was good. Uh, second semester was tougher than the first one, but I, you know, I had a good time. Good. Is Kevin out there? Yes. Hi, I'm Kevin Ahern. I just graduated from Dreyfus School of the Arts in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, and next year I'll be attending the University of Texas at Austin. Wonderful. Is Kyle there? Hi, yes. My name is Kyle Ahern. I am Kevin's twin brother. I am also a just graduated senior from Dreyfus School of the Arts in Florida, and I am also a rising freshman at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome. Okay, um, so before we begin the seminar, I just want to give you sort of our philosophy about what um, ISD and TERP is. Um, I come, we come, I should say, to the world of INTERP um, more from the perspective that it, uh, we want to provide our students who come to camp um, with the opportunity to gain the skills necessary to be able to build an interp with us at camp, but also to replicate that. And we would never, uh, in our right minds, um, just hand a student uh, a cutting and say, here, do this cutting. Our goal is to take the student through the entire process of finding a piece of literature that is appropriate for them and their skill level, and then teach them the entire process <clears throat> uh, as we go through um, to decide what story they wanna tell, um, find the best means and the best process to cut that material down, be it a novel, a play, a prose, a, a collection, whatever, to um, the appropriate cutting size that they need, and then to develop the characters and the environment and to put it all together so that they end up with a 10 minute, believable, impactful message that they can share through the voice of these characters. <clears throat> we want their characters to come to life. Uh, we want them to live and to tell their story. And that just can't be done um, by handing someone a cutting and say, here, do this. And so our goal is, be it online or in an in-camp setting, is to take each student, no matter whether they're uh, just coming out of eighth grade and beginning and have never actually competed in intert before, or they've competed for three years in intert. Um, our goal is to take every student as far as we can possibly take them and teach them all the skills that they will need in order to have a successful season. Ian, Lillian, do you want to add anything to that? I guess not. So, no, I, I, no, I was going to. I thought Ian was going to go. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, Ian, are you going? Um, yeah. So basically, what Meg said. Um, the, I think the biggest thing about what you get out when you come to to any type of camp is to to make the cutting your own. And like Meg said, we're not into that cookie cutter, finding something off of a, a vault and giving you someone else's cutting. 
um, the main process and what we do here at ISD that um, makes us different is that we make we um, guide you through the entire um, building of your program because um, at the end of the summer if it's not yours you're not going to do well throughout the year because it's not yours it's it's going to be Lily's cutting or Ian's cutting or Jared's cutting or or Kyle or Kevin's cutting and that's not what we want we want to help guide you through that process, through that learning process. And if you can grasp that, you'll be successful throughout the year. And beyond. And now I think I can jump in because that was super well said. I think that we supply a pretty strong diversity of perspective and experience on interpretation. One thing that you're going to see pretty soon is my critiques, Matt critiques, and Lily's critiques regarding uh, Kevin Ahern's dramatic interpretation. And you'll see some parts of the Venn diagram where we overlap, but some parts where we don't. And I think that seeing that diversity of critique play out, but allowing yourself as the actor, the director, the dramaturge to take from that what you will and develop those portable skills, I think we really excel in that. We are diverse and we don't always agree. And that's okay because there are a wealth of opinions that find themselves uh, successful. So our goal with an online camp is to help you uh, gain the skills necessary to um, have a successful season. For this seminar, what we're focusing on is this new world that we live in and videotaping um, our dramatic pieces. I spent all morning with one of my orators videotaping her oratory for the senior open that's going to happen this weekend. And it was helpful that I had judged at some virtual tournaments and I could have, I saw what worked and what didn't work. It was also helpful that, that we had been through this process with Kevin, with working with his dramatic interp, because everything about this whole virtual tournament changes what an interp is like. Um, being in a room versus being on a tape. Essentially what you're doing is you're converting from a stage actor to a film actor and they're vastly different um, beasts. So our goal with the seminar is to highlight some of the uh, problems and issues that you might have as you begin putting uh, your piece on videotape and maybe you've participated in some of the virtual tournaments uh, and got some comments and want to see what's the best way that we can correct some of those. Maybe you haven't started that process at all and hopefully we're going to eliminate a lot of your headaches as we go through this process. So virtual tournaments are here. A lot of big national tournaments have already announced that they're going to be virtual in the fall. And so whether you're preparing to go to nationals to the NSDA national tournament in, in a couple of weeks or whether you're thinking ahead and some of you coaches may be here doing that, saying, I need to know what I need to do in order to help my students. Um, we hopefully are gonna be able to take you through a little bit of that process. Um, let's go to the next slide, Ian. Um, first, we're going to uh, interpret uh, a segment, or actually uh, Kevin's dramatic interp that he put up for a couple of virtual tournaments. <clears throat> and we're all going to watch it. And you might wanna take notes and pretend you're a judge and write down some things that worked or didn't work for you, um, having it be on videotape. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go over the comments that Ian and Lillian and I posted and shared with Kevin and then we'll discover the difference that uh, some changes in how you videotape and how you perform for a camera uh, in order to make the big difference in selling that piece. So if there are no questions, let's go to the video. So here I'm going to unshare my screen really fast so that Lily can take over and stream it for you. But in case there's any issue with the streaming, we're also giving you the link so you can follow along. Yeah, there's a link right down there. It's... Yeah. 
I'll... I can put that in the chat as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, that would be good. So I'll stop the share, and Lily, if you can grab the screen. Yes, I will grab it now. Okay. Does everyone see? I'm going to go in and play. Mike, on my meeting, sorry. I'll play again. Sound. Hold on. My apologies. I don't know why the sound is not playing. Jillian, I can try it if you want. I haven't had Thank issues. Thank you. Go ahead. Can you share it? Thanks, Becca. <clears throat> Technology. Hold on. Thanks. All right. If you could give me a thumbs up, if you can hear it, that'd be great. <laughs> well, hey, Lorelai, calm down, okay? Girl, whoa! Okay, okay, Lorelai, okay, 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 okay. You gonna be a good girl, huh? You gonna be a good girl, okay? Okay, ready? Go ahead, go! <laughs> go play. <laughs> My name? Paul! Hi. What's yours? Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Great weather we're having today, right? I mean, a little chilly, but... Uh... <laughs> oh, uh, her name is Lorelai. She's a rotation rich fat <laughs> What kind of dog do you have? Huh? Oh, she's so cute! Honestly, uh, no. Lorelai is my wife Lexi's dog. You know, I used to be so afraid of that. So it just kind of, kind of washed me once I got to know Lorelai. Hmm. Story goes that Lorelai entered Lexi's life when she was about five months old. I mean, literally just jumped on her doorstep one day and that was it. <laughs> That's how Lorelai and Lexi came to belong to one another, as Lexi might tell you if she were here. What about you? 
How long have you had her? Nice. Yeah, you know, the way I see it, dogs, I mean, they're witnesses. You know, we give them this this access to all of these super private moments of our lives, I just feel like, I mean, <laughs> if we could speak to them, all those little, those gaps in our lives would just stitch together. <laughs> which is why, okay, which is why after 20 years of devoting my life to the study of linguistics, ah, what? Lorelai, come here, you bad girl. Come here. Well, I, I, sit. I have decided to teach a dog. Mm -hmm. To speak. Intellectualization is explained by Dr. Susan Whitmore as a defense mechanism where individuals turn towards academia to rationalize a traumatic experience. Paul Iverson, a lifelong linguistics professor, decides to teach his dog Lorelai to speak and ultimately teaches us that if we don't face our experiences, they will consume us. The Dogs of Babel by Carolyn Parkhurst. No, okay. <laughs> I know what you must be thinking. A year ago, I've been just as skeptical as you, but you have to understand how the events of the past few months, well, they, um, <laughs> they change your way of thinking, my right, girl. <laughs> oh, oh no, she's super sweet. Go say hi, girl. Go say hi. Uh, oh, perhaps you're familiar with some of the more. Lorelai. Lorelai, stop that, right? Lorelai, gosh, where are your men? I'm just gonna, um, I can, get to clean that up. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Lorelai, come here, girl. Hey, we talked about this, right? Don't poop on strangers, okay? Go ahead, go. Uh, I'm just gonna, I hope she didn't ruin your shoes. They're really nice, okay? Dogs, you know, you can never really. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you're familiar with some of the more celebrated cases of language acquisition in dogs, but my favorite is this, this Chu Chi Tzu. Who learned this kind of phrase? I love you. Yeah, I mean, I saw this on amateur video, so is it real? They don't really know. <laughs> so, each morning, we go through a list of words I know Lorelai understands. <laughs> more life! More life, go back to back, bro. <laughs> okay, okay, let's do it. I'm gonna show the next man what you can do, okay? So, my good practice, repeat after me. Broccoli. No? <laughs> repeat after me. Broccoli. Oh, no, she's she's just being shy. Um, I promise. Lorelai knows about fifty different words and phrases. Um, dinner and treat, car and ride, yes and no. The first time I asked my wife, Lexi, to marry me, she told me no. <laughs> she just, she didn't understand how I, how I, how I could love her. I mean, you, Lexi, you know that she is so easy to love. Yeah. I became a linguist, mostly in part because of words. They have failed me my entire life. I don't know, with Lexi, it's just it's always been so easy. And eventually we <laughs> we did get married. 
and we had the a, a small and <laughs> private wedding, and it was it was beautiful. And you know, she brought Lorelai, <laughs> which was which was weird and caused a lot of chaos. But you know, Lexi is so good where they have this this language. I find it so frustrating that Lorelai cannot understand me. I don't know, I just, I keep having this, this dream. Okay, that Lorelai actually does speak to me. It, it's a little weird, okay, but in it, in it, I, I, I'm sitting at my kitchen table with a plate of spaghetti and meatballs in front of me. I don't know. Okay, and Lorelai, she walks in with these on her high level, which it's, it's already hilarious, right? And she has this, this voice. I mean, it's so high pitched and cartoonish. And she looks in, <laughs> she says, she says, she says, give me a meatball. She says, she says give me a meatball. <laughs> October 24th, my wife, Lexi, she, she climbed to the top of the tree in her backyard and she, she jumped. I didn't know I was at work. And our neighbors, they, they knew Lorelai, most of them, but they heard this. I'll stop sharing. All right. I guess, Ian, you're going to pull up um, that. Yeah. So everyone, to walk through the little ISD thing that we're doing here, the I was for interpret, which means the S will be for suggest. So I'm going to pull up some of the critiques and suggestions that have come from a number of the coaches. Let me just do that right now. Sharon screen in three, two, one. Sharon screen now. So y'all should be able to see a lot of critiques across this. You see a bunch from me, you see a bunch from Lily, then from Meg, then from Jared. And obviously, we're not going to read everything out word for word. So I wanted to start off just by highlighting some of the things that 
are consistent across all of them. It's notable that every coach who looked at this pointed out that there was a great deal of empty space right above the performance and that some of the moments that were very effective in person, for example, the performer going towards the audience, the performer leaning down on the ground, were far less effective in this context because we couldn't see the performer's body when he went further down. Lily, who saw this earlier in the year, she says here, I saw you in finals of Emory, directly compares the physical performance to the virtual performance. So I wanted to give that as an overview before we got into the specifics. Meg, would you like to take it? Meg, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so if you can scroll over to, um, to my comments and we'll just, I, I'm just gonna highlight some of the things that I particularly noticed. Um, Kevin starts very far back. And as a result of that, um, I don't get, and I'm gonna talk mostly about characterization and how the use of the space and the audio and then the camera affect our ability as an audience member to really cue in to that character. So here we obviously have this man who's lost his wife, he's traumatized, he's like sunk his life into this dog and he's encountering this person in a dog park. <clears throat> and the environment, Kevin did a great job of creating that environment and creating uh, the use of the dog as, a, as another character in that piece that we never see. Um, so kudos to him for that. But the problem that I experienced most was uh, early in the piece, he's so far at the back of the space that we lose a lot of his lines because the audio becomes choppy and is unclear. And some of those are very, very important lines that clue us in to the pain and suffering that this man is feeling. Likewise, some of the, <clears throat> some of the other issues that hamper the characterization is that also because he's so far back, I don't really get to see his eyes and the pain in his eyes. Notice toward the end of the piece when he moves more forward toward the camera, I'm actually able to see, we're able to see his face. Um, we're able to see his face and look into his eyes and I wholeheartedly feel the pain that this character is feeling and this sense of loss and this sense of need and struggle that he's going through um, to try to convince Lorelai to talk so that he can understand. Um, and so the camera is really, really important. Uh, and you have to take all of that into consideration when you're videotaping. And maybe, like when you're competing in a tournament, you want to use that space and maybe start a little further back and work your way forward. That may need to be rethought as you reconsider like facial expressions, tone up, tonal changes, and really getting at the heart of the character by appealing to the camera and like really looking into the camera and allowing us to feel those things that the character is feeling. Um, lots of times, in Kevin's performance, he got really quiet. Uh, and those are obvious emotional aspects uh, and points in the, in the piece that would be fine in a classroom, but on camera, they totally got washed away. And so for me, I had the volume when I watched, first watched it, I turned the volume up on my computer all of the way, but I still couldn't hear the depth of the line. And so you need to make sure that your volume takes care of that or that you might speak it a little bit louder rather than your, in your softer tones so that you can still be heard. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at my comments here to see, um, oh, I don't know if you realize it, but like he, once he lets Lorelai go, he 
takes off a, a backpack. I knew it was a backpack, but my question is, is that really necessary? Is it, it, does it add anything to the character and to this moment? And so my suggestion was, think about that. And if it's not necessary, then, you know, if it doesn't add something to the piece or it add, doesn't add something to the environment, maybe it's not necessary. Um, and then there was a whole series of moments when uh, Lorelai has an accident on this person he's talking to in the park. Uh, and it's a lighter moment. And then he goes up. And so part of my, um, one of my critiques to Kevin was, if my dog did that, and I have two that are wandering around behind me, if, I, if one of my dogs did that, I would be mortified. Uh, and I didn't read embarrassment or even see the slight humor of the situation or any of that. And so I think that Kevin needs to make some adjustments on that characterization in order for the embarrassment to come through. So you have to think about what emotions you want to come through for the character and then how are they playing on the camera. Okay, so I'm either going to flip it to Ian or Lillian, whichever one of you wants to go next. I'll go next. Um, so um, just kind of uh, like uh, Ian said earlier, I um, saw uh, Kevin's performance in finals at um, Emory and so you have to understand in this virtual world, it's very important, um, just kind of reiterating what Meg said, you wanna make it as intimate as possible. So if you, we don't need to see below your knees, quite frankly, <laughs> in this virtual world. So coming closer to the camera, like me being way out here versus me telling you the story right here can make a big difference, right? Because you're no longer in a room with someone, you're basically have become a movie actress, right? Um, or an actor. So um, that's one thing, I can't even see my uh, critiques on here. Um, one thing that was, I saw from the whole experience, but Kevin does do a really good job when he's talking to that character that he's created, that he's in the dog park. I, I, I felt like I was that person. I was like, oh, you're really telling me about Lorelai. I wanna know about this dog and your family. Um, or in your wife and everything. So he does a really good job of using the um, camera as the character, right? Um, I like to tell my kids when we're preparing, if you're gonna do different characters, right? So you have your, your frame, to the left of your frame, to the right of your frame, right above your frame is where you're, you're gonna make your characters. You can't make them big like you could in an actual classroom, right? Because you looking way over here is awkward when the audience is looking at you. So it's very important that you figure out what your frame of reference is when you're building your characters. Um, another thing, please, 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 I don't know if Meg mentioned it, you are doing, your introduction needs to be done to the camera. <laughs> don't do the little fake. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to this person to the right of the room, to the left of the room. There's nobody in the room with you. <laughs> so it's very important that you do your introduction to the uh to your recording device all right so then you'll have to do all that um uh i think meg mentioned it that it's very important in a virtual performance that just as important as going loud or louder to um to give off emotion i think it's even more powerful that in a virtual performance that your emotion can be that nonverbal. What? Okay, so you just, it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm so upset, I'm so mad, why me? Versus, okay, do y'all see the difference in that? So it doesn't have to be big, because we can clearly see you, right? So those um, more intense moments draw back a little bit. Use the nonverbal. Oh, the nonverbal is so awesome. Um, that when I judged in mass, that nonverbal just being quiet and just looking at the camera to emote. Use it, use it, use it. So um, that's really all I'm going to say. I'm gonna give it to Ian because time is not for against is against us a little bit. Yep. 
Ian, do you have anything? Thought he was muted. He needs to unmute. He's smiling. I think he's frozen. Am I good? Yeah, yeah you're good now. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, first thing, real fast. I think that it's important to reimagine forensics cliches during these times of virtual competition. A forensics cliche is to yell your intro. This intro was yelled, a number of the critiquers commented on the degree to which it felt awkward. A second thing is realize that we are now living in a world of online distractions. So anything that takes us out of it is a reason to mark a competitor down or not give them the one comparatively. And there are moments here that took me out of it, like the backpack moment that was mentioned before. Or in this case, my pre-existing knowledge of the Donnie Darko voice that was done in the national championship piece last year got in the way of the Lorelei speak because that's a much deeper voice. And so I'm thinking about a demon as opposed to a loving dog owner. So I think trying to intentionally avoid those cliches in a world where it's so easy to look up a previous performance on YouTube before a ballot is submitted, that is a really important thing. And the, the final thing that I would note is all of the critiquers here talked about the necessity of motivated movement and decision making which means for these competitors, for these characters, if I don't understand why the character acted that way, your charisma, which might have carried you in person, can no longer carry you online in the same way. And so we focus on that really consistently throughout all of these critiques across this page. I think that we're gonna be able to share this with you at the very end if you wanna go into this in more depth. But my very first critique is, I'm not sure if the laughter at the very start is motivated. It is a forensics cliche to do a bit like, <laughs> I'm just a likable character right now. <laughs> Gonna laugh a little. But it comes across differently in an online context. Because our frames for what online performance is, is shaped by YouTube. It's shaped by vloggers. It's shaped by these online speeches that we see. And so the forensics norm can be challenged. So I really wanted to highlight that. Jared, do you hear some ideas? Um, I think a lot of what I found important was talked about, but the, the necessity for being motivated, especially on camera and understanding how the camera comes off to the audience too, because um, there's a lot of conventions to performing for a big audience versus the camera and the the view the that i get just from a video is different than if i'm sitting in an audience and i think it needs to be a little bit more at least from this video it needed to be a little bit more tailored to a camera viewer uh i would agree and it's interesting that when you say that it makes me recall so many times when um we've been in those semi rounds and there was an outstanding performance in semis that makes it to finals and it just doesn't play the same on the big stage as it does in the classroom. Well, the same applies here. You have to make sure that what you're doing plays with the medium that you're being forced to use. So whether it's a classroom or a big stage for a final performance, or even for a video camera. And so it's very important to take all those things into consideration. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Before we watch Kevin's second performance, hang on a second. Before we do that, I'd like Kevin to talk about how it felt to um, take the comments, make decisions about what he could incorporate, what he chose not to incorporate, what he chose to work on, and all of those kinds of things. Kevin? Yeah, so um, I think one of the biggest things that I focused on when I was doing the revised um, performance was that um, thing that I believe Meg mentioned earlier about um, switching from a theater actor to more of a screen actor. So. Um, my DI, for those who have seen it in um, like the live round, is very focused on audience interaction. Um, for example, the part where the dog um, has the accident on the stranger. 
um, that is always something that I like, you know, play up in a round. And when I did the original video, I kind of just did what I do in round and um, didn't adjust to the screen. And when I revised it, I think I kind of, um, you'll notice, I think that I throw away more of the lines, not in a way that's bad, but like how a screen actor would, where they would try to just say it um, and not upplay it, you know, and um, try to get a reaction from an audience that's not there, right? Because um, in interp, a lot of the times we um, are trying to get gain a reaction. So because we're there, we can see it and we can feel judges and we can feel competitors, but there's no one to give you that reaction. So like Lillian really hit on that intimacy is what I tried to really um, exploit more in the um, revised edition. Um, and yeah, I hope I accomplished that. Um, so we'll see. Okay, Becca, let's see it. Ian, are you done? Can I overrule, override your, oh, there we go. All right. Everybody, this is Becca. She is on the Congress and uh, ISD staff and she's helping us out tonight. Stop after intro. Yeah. Oh, hey girl, calm down, okay? Look her alive, look her alive. Whoa! Okay, 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 okay. You're gonna be a good girl, huh? You're gonna be a good girl, okay? Okay, ready? Go ahead, go. <laughs> go play. <laughs> My name? Paul, hi. What's yours? Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, great weather we're having today, right? I mean, a little chilly, but um. Oh, uh, Lorelai. She's a Rhodesian Ridgeback, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what kind of dog do you have? Her? Oh, she's so cute. Honestly, Lorelai is my wife Lexi's dog. You know, I used to be so afraid of dogs. They just kind of, kind of washed away once I got to know Lorelai. Oh, story goes that Lorelai entered Lexi's life when she was about, I mean, I mean literally just showed up on her doorstep one day and that was it. That's how Lorelai and Lexi came to belong to one another, as Lexi might tell you if she were here. Oh, what about you? How long have you had her? You know, the way I see it, dogs are witnesses. We give them this, this access to all of these super private moments of our lives. I just feel like, I mean, <laughs> how are you going to speak to them? <laughs> all those little, those gaps in our lives would just stitch together, you know? Which is why. Which is why, after 20 years of devoting my life to the study of linguistics, ah, more life, more life, come here, girl. come here, whoa, okay, okay. I have decided to teach a doll to speak. Intellectualization is explained by Dr. Susan Whitbourne as a defense mechanism, where individuals turn towards academia to rationalize a traumatic experience. Paul Iverson, a lifelong linguistics professor, decides to teach his dog Lorelei to speak and ultimately teaches us that if we do not face our experiences, they'll consume us. The Dogs of Babel by Carolyn Parkhurst. <laughs> okay, Ian, let's take it to the slide and I'm going to go over um, some of the highlights 
that we came up with um, for, uh, for you all to consider when you're um, performing virtually for a camera. So let's start with the don't list because I wanna highlight those. Please don't scan the room at the beginning, um, sort of like that generic thing that Ian talked about. Um, remember you're playing to an audience and the audience for me is that camera. There's nobody sitting over there and there's nobody sitting over there. Don't be gimmicky um, and go for the big laugh um, because you're not gonna get it. There's nobody that's going to feed you that laughter. And so if something's naturally funny, it will come, but going for something silly or gimmicky is probably going to hurt you, um, more likely to hurt you than not. Make sure that you have your hair uh, out of your face and that it doesn't obstruct your eyes uh, and don't go over time. Um, the, we were filming today and there were a couple of moments where the video, she got to like the last three words and it just cuts off. So be aware of that. Um, um, don't use any blocking below the knees or that causes you to have to go to the ground. Think back to that first performance uh, of Kevin's DI. There were a couple of times he went and like one time he was just completely off the screen. And so in the revised version of that, he didn't do that and it was much better. But if you go off the screen, then there's nobody to see what you're doing and what you're doing then doesn't become important in this scene. Um, so things to consider about doing. Do follow the rules for recording. Um, that is something that is your responsibility as a student to read, to understand, and to follow. Uh, make sure that your room, wherever you're videotaping, is well lit. Natural light is by all the best, by all means the best, like a big nice window that has nice light coming in and you're facing that light rather than being to the side. If I turn my face slightly this way, this side of my face is in shadow, so we wouldn't want the light there and we, wouldn't, we would want it like full face so that our entire face is lit up and that the audience can see your facial features. Don't be afraid to come closer to the camera uh, so that you can uh, provide us that intimate experience that we need in order to empathize with your characters or, and be that funny or, or humorous. It doesn't matter. I mean, humorous or serious, it doesn't matter. Like really getting in so we can see those facial expressions makes us understand and appreciate your character even more. Uh, make sure you give your, your introduction directly to the camera and don't yell. Notice the second version of Kevin's intro was much more real, much more human, and we wanted to listen. We wanted to understand in that second version so much more. Um, also ensure that your voice is clear and can be heard even in the softer moments. And so you might have to adjust how you deliver those lines in order to um, show that variation. Uh, in recording that oratory, I was working with a student today recording an oratory, and this last one says record multiple times. Record, record, record. Record in different lightings, record at different times of the day, morning light versus afternoon light versus midday light. Record in different rooms, maybe with different lighting situations. And make sure that your background isn't distracting and taking away from the environment that you're trying to create for your audience. So let's open up to a few questions or comments from the audience. So if you wanna take this down and uh, go to, or maybe we can go to the last screen first before we take it down. So uh, not that one, the one before. So um, obviously we would love to have you join us this summer for our online camp. What we're going to do is, what hopefully this showed you, is that uh, coaching can occur in the same room, but can occur also 
in an online situation. Um, we can meet virtually and be together talking like we are in this meeting now, or we can have you record and then share videos with us and work that way. We'll have live lectures and we'll have recorded lectures and we'll have fun time. Um, so we hope that you will consider um, working with us this summer. We would love to be able to provide um, the best online experience for you. So Ian, hit that next slide. And so I'm gonna leave this screen up here for just a second. Um, I'm providing you with our emails because this is what we're going to offer you. Um, if you have a clip or a video, we really were hoping to get to those tonight, but time is escaping us. Um, but if you have a question or you wanna share uh, a piece that you're recording or you wanna share a specific, specific problem that you're not sure how to handle and you wanna share that with one or all of us, uh, I guarantee you that we will uh, reach out and give you comments and uh, hopefully help you create the best performance uh, that you can have as you prepare for nationals. So Ian, if you want, if you want to take a picture of that or whatever, but this will be available on the ISU website as well. You can come back and get to this. But if you want to take the screen down and then we can go to the meeting and allow people to have a question and answer for the next five or 10 minutes and Um, while, while Ian is taking down the screen, um, I think on the last slide, Meg mentioned that recording multiple times. And since we have a lot of coaches in here, I can't reiterate it enough to you coaches for your kids that are doing the um, recorded videos for nationals. That's what my practice is. My kids have to send me a recording, like we have practice tomorrow. So the recording should be in the Google Drive before practice begins. And we watch that recording together to do critique kind of like we just did now. Because I think since we don't have that ability to be in a classroom with them, telling them what they need to do movement wise, them practicing those recordings, even if it's just in regular clothing, I make my kids dress up cause I'm extra, but I was like, I need you to be in your clothes, dressed, ready to go like you were in a tournament. <laughs> cause I was like, I need you to feel how it feels in that suit or you know, whatever. So, but um, even if they're in their um, just regular clothes, uh, making them, I think you, you like, the more you practice, the better it gets. So um, I think we're, having them record multiple times is just a really good idea. And it also lets them see themselves. And so, cause you know, sometimes you tell them things and they're like, I don't get what she's talking about. But then when they see it, they're like, oh, Coach A, I see it now, yeah. So um, um, making your kids record before, even before you submit is a really good idea. And if you haven't looked at Pam's critiques on the chat, she gave some really good critiques as well for um, the videos that we just watched. Sorry. Good. Go ahead and look. Are there any questions or comments from anyone, students, coaches, anybody? You Meg, just... it's, it, it's Pam. Hi, Pam. I, can you tell me, did this student film with um, a video camera, uh, an iPad? He can. Uh, um, so I filmed those with my phone, but um, I would, what I, from doing it, I am planning on uh, for NSA doing it on my laptop only because um, with the phone, it's harder to get the ink because the phone tilts a little bit oddly and I think the laptop, you can get it to be like more straight back. So that's Okay, so I'm going to fix something for you. I recorded with a, uh, iPhone 11 today and her little brother took Legos and he built a stand, essentially a tripod for her iPhone to sit in. And uh, we taped the iPhone uh, to the stand to get it exactly the way we wanted it. But there are ways that you can do it. I, I thought the iPhone, it was, I think it's an 11. Uh, I thought the audio and the, and the video on it was just stellar today. I worry, like, unless you have a great camera on your laptop, I worry about not being able, or, and the audio, I worry about it not being as strong. Yeah. 
I would concur. And the other thing, if you're going back to Meg's suggestion, WeatherTech has a great cup holder for phones. Yeah. And I would suggest anybody making that investment, yeah. if you're going to use your phone to film, that that would be a great thing to do. We just built a tripod out of Legos and it worked. That'll work. It was amazing. Other questions? Just chime in if I can't see you on screen. Hi, this is Radia from Charlotte, from Providence. Hi. Hi. Um, I've noticed um, the difference in, in speaking on um, in person the way we do at a tournament versus how it sounds on camera. A lot of us get into this very speechy, I'm getting ready to perform for you voice, and it doesn't read as well on camera. So I think even um, in the performance that we saw, um, I think that students need to be very cognizant of how they sound. Maybe they can pull back from that very stagey voice and use something that's more conversational, um, more intimate, like you and Lillian mentioned. Yeah, I Rob, think that would be helpful. I would even say that that is a, uh, a technique that, Absolutely. that is like infiltrated, I will say. Absolutely. <laughs> but I will tell you, 100% of the time, I prefer the performance where it's never used, not in the classroom, Agreed. not on the big stage. I want that real, Agreed. believable, yes. human performance. And Agreed. when somebody's turning it on to sound like this, mm -hmm. it's not real to me. It's not. And so students, as you think about your characters and what, what the habits that you've created by watching other competitors, think mm -hmm. about how you're going to use that because it the camera makes it bigger. Mm -hmm. Other questions and comments? You can even put them in the chat and we can share them that way. Debbie just Nicole had Jenkins, one in the chat. Um, Nicole Jenkins also suggested the phone holder uh, with a light ring and she provides in the chat, if you guys want to look at it, the Amazon link to it. Yeah, the light ring does help. Um, it's very important. I'm gonna talk for my darker skin hue people. Make sure you find a place with good lighting. Um, I told, I think um, uh, my student, just take a lamp at your house and take off the shade and put it near your recording device. It lights up your face. So um, like Meg talked about those dark angles, they, they go away. So if you're darker complexion, very important you find a place with good lighting for your video as well recording we did that today at school we somebody had a lamp on one of their desks we took off the shade put it just in front like next to the camera so that it sort of lightened up the area and made no shadows on her face anybody else want to share ask a question Oh, uh, there's a question over here. Sam says, any question, any suggestions about the split screen duo? Has anybody done that? I haven't done that yet. Kyle and Kevin. No. I don't know <laughs> about that. We're doing duo at nationals. So we have been playing around with a lot of different um, services and what works best for us. I think what, uh, what we're going to um, attempt to do, we have not finalized anything yet. But, and what people are doing is, is using Zoom. And the things that we've noticed to keep in mind are that when you are recording a split screen duo, the person who records the video, they're, they're, they're flipped on the, when the recording is done or what, something, someone gets flipped. So you yeah. have to make a lot of testing out all of your platforms. Otherwise your video will be completely wrong. Something else that we are doing is just as you guys all said for the individual performances, being up close and have, and like, even though Duo relies on a lot more tech, things like that, we have noticed that stripping it, stripping it of that and having it be more up close, more about um, the connection between the two people. Because at the end of the day, um, if you can communicate a, a relationship intimately through a screen to the judge, we think, we feel, and we're not sure yet, that that will be the most effective way to stand out as opposed to 
doing the same thing that you would do in a normal round. Yeah, and I have a quick addition to that that I find to be really important that we're struggling with. Um, with the split screen duo, because you're not being filmed obviously in the same room or um, in the same space, it's important to try and do your best to measure that your camera is the same distance from your partner and the same height that your I partner would be. Yes, yes. Hey masking tape on the floor to create your frame. So yeah. we did it today, masking, ma put masking tape on the floor. This is the furthest, this like, way I can go. This is the furthest, this way I can go. This is the further forward that I can go with still keeping my head in the screen. And mm -hmm. that whole thing, stage actors use it, film actors use it, tape the floor. Yes, and um, because what's gonna happen is your duo partner is gonna be this close, they're gonna be here and it's gonna look like this. So you really want to try and mitigate all of those um, those issues. Good suggestion. Yes, Victoria. I have a question. Um, you know how the DI was considerably subdued and it worked great for the camera. Mm -hmm. What about HI? Do we need to subdue that too and be close to the camera? You literally shaking her head. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's just like Vicky. It's like acting on TV. You know, right? So. Um, when I'm watching Kevin Hart uh, do a stand-up, right, or whatever, I don't want him way far from me when I'm watching it on Netflix. I want him close and giving those, um, his performance right, you know, more intimately versus, I think it's the same way with HI. And uh, I think Ian mentioned those little gimmicky things that you're waiting for the audience reaction. You're going to have to get rid of those because, or just kind of mitigate those because if it doesn't come off real and genuine, no one's gonna, gonna feel lay it. a big bomb yeah exactly thank you um what i'd also suggest really fast for hi is that i've seen in these high tier national competitions online story is being rewarded far more than in person yeah. and that could be a very good thing as a trend for the community it can lead to better character development more interesting acting choices but we've seen story come before gag pieces story come before the pieces where for example it's one person who's the straight man character encountering a bunch of silly characters i think is less rewarded um i i was on a uh, a chat online today and uh, a coach friend was videotaping for the senior um and they were or maybe she was just practicing but she was doing a duo side by side and she couldn't get the side by side correct. And then she came back and she said that, that somebody helped her or reminded her to make sure that her screen was not maximized because when it was maximized, it wasn't doing the side by side. One of them was flipped. And so you have to pull back from that maximized screen in order to be, in order to be able to get it right. So just a thought. Another, another, yeah, another suggestion for duo, you guys, with that split screen, honestly, I had a, um, kids qualify for duos like I can't do it but it just came to me um really <laughs> like they talked about when you think of split screen it's kind of like you can't do all the different nuances of blocking that you did before you're really your character you're pretending as if your character is in front of you right um the person you're acting with is right in front of you so you're here but um it's almost a lot like collegiate almost like the way collegiate does blocking where everything is forward right and um that's how you can think of it i think ethan had a question about that because i had siblings that uh qualified as well and they live in the same house but they have to do split screen right just like um kevin and kyle they live together but we can't physically um do duo together right now so when you think of your split screen think of as if your partner's in front of you when acting and making sure you do the um levels and making sure your levels are correct so Think of it as like that. Maybe that might help when you're um, doing your blocking. Katie Thomas has a great, great uh, comment in the chat. If you're following the chat, um, she's like, whether you're doing something that's comedic or humorous, to remember that it's something that is funny to your character. And if you think about real humor, it isn't always um big it's just like in dramatic moments humor can be in the quiet moments also 
and she listened, she was talks in the chat over here about listening to Melissa McCarthy in a podcast talk about um, how she re re reiterated that point that humor is, it's funny to the character, okay? Other ideas, questions, or comments? You guys are great. This has been amazing and so much fun. I see my friend Debbie. I wanted to say hi to her. Hi, Debbie. Um, other questions before we say good night? Ian, Lily, Jared, Becca, Kyle, Kevin, thank you so much for your help on putting this together. Thank you, Chase, if you're still out there for making sure that we have the platform and we're able to provide this as a service to uh, students and coaches. Um, we hope um, that you will consider uh, online camp this summer uh, with ISD. Um, it's no different than what we experienced for the last nine weeks of teaching online. Um, and I've been coaching online. And so we're gonna do things in person like we're doing them right now. We're gonna do things recorded. We're gonna do everything we can to provide you the same environment, um, the same skills, the same learning that you would have if you were with us uh, at camp. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for putting your DI up for critique and watching, and thank you for going to the effort to redo it. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed it. And with that, we'll say good night. Good night.